so uh, this, uh, this work that I will present, uh, uh, the theoretical part has been done during the years in collaboration with uh, Levi Hoffe, Kitayev, and uh, re more recently for simulation, Manuel Pino. And while uh, uh, experimental work, we talk a lot with a uh, group of John Martinis, uh, Robert McDermott, and uh, University of Madison, and um, uh, Nakamura when he was at NEC, and uh, more recently, Will Oliver at MIT Lincoln Lab. So, um, so uh, the problem, uh, this problem started um, uh, in the late 80s when uh, Fred Westwood was a graduate student uh, in the group of John Clark and uh, Berkeley. And basically, he was uh, measuring uh, noise in uh, different uh, kind of squids of different material built on this uh, silicon oxide substrate uh, with different uh, shape. And uh, what they found uh, is that uh, all the squid were affected by an excess low frequency flux noise. And uh, please, uh, I want just to focus on the, the noise at uh, temperature low below uh, 0 0.5 Kelvin. What basically they, they saw is that for different uh, shape uh, of these uh, squids, the noise uh, was more or less uh, universal. And uh, the noise was uh, one, one over F with some power. And um, another important feature that he, it observed is that uh, uh, the noise was uh, temperature depend, in, depend, independent. And um, uh, they tried to understand at the time what could be the microscopic origin of the noise, but uh, this problem was unsolved and was forgotten until, uh, let me see, sorry, yes, until uh, people from another community that is uh, started to be interested in trying to implement a superconducting device by using uh, superconducting qubits. And uh, one key element, uh, in these uh, superconducting qubits are uh, squids. And what they found out is that in the new generation of squids that were made uh, in aluminum, both for the phase, for example, for the flux, uh, with different datums, different uh, dimension, again, uh, the coherence of the device was limited by uh, the phasing. And uh, the amplitude of this dephasing, again, was uh, comparable with the measurement that was done in an early squid. So it started again to be important to understand what uh, could be the microscopic origin. And then uh, one of the first in this community that tried to understand more about this noise was the group of John Martinez at uh, Santa Barbara. And in 2007, they did the uh, other experiment with aluminum squid loop built on sapphire substrate with aluminum junction. And what um, they found is that uh, basically they confirmed what uh, Westwood was seeing um, previously, namely that uh, they found this uh, 1 over F noise that was a very low frequency noise. The amplitude was uh, almost 1 over F. They found again that the, it was temperature independence below 500 millikase. They, uh, uh, they showed that there was an area independence of the flux noise power spectrum and that there was absolutely no dependence on the kind of substrate. And again, the magnitude of the noise uh, was uh, comparable before. So uh, based um, on this uh, new experiment, we started to, to think uh, what could have been a possible mechanism. And what uh, is clear is that since uh, this noise persists at very low temperature, it means that whatever is the, the, the dynamics that, could, that uh, is uh, present in this, uh, in this system has to have some very small energy scale. And immediately, uh, thermal excited to level system or vortices were ruled out. And so in our thinking, what could have been more promising candidate were either weakly interacting nuclear or electron spin. But on the other hand, the fact that uh, there was evidence that the substrate uh, could, didn't play any role in the noise. 
And uh, moreover, we had the clear information from the group of Nakamura at NEC that did nice echo experiment, and they showed that this noise was going up to frequency 10 to megahertz. It became clear that nuclear spins that usually have this uh, uh, frequency were not um, important in the game. And so we started to think that um, uh, the plausible uh, candidate for this node were paramagnetic spin and the uh, uh, superconducting insulator interface. And uh, the first problem that we had was that uh, why at uh, the, the interface? Because if you think at the normal interaction between these pins in insulator that are mediated via dipole dipole interaction, you basically see a, a const, an interaction strength that is in this, um, of this value for the typical frequency of this for the frequency or density of this paramagnetic spin. And so we started to think that in order to explain the, um, this higher frequency cutoff, what you need is to have some stronger spin interaction. And so the natural candidate was to think that uh, the paramagnetic spin uh, dynamic, the interaction was mediated through the uh, electrons uh, in the superconductors. And uh, we gave uh, some um, uh, estimate. So the mechanism is RKKY interaction between the spin and the typical energy scale of the interaction by typical density that we, we knew from experiment uh, uh, in, uh, in other contexts of these typical paramagnetic spins uh, gave us uh, this um, uh, sort of scale that was a uh, 50 millik. Right after, and um, the question was uh, also to understand how the noise was generated. So we decided to consider that uh, the important feature was uh, to have a diffusion mechanism. So we, we know uh, which is the typical diffusion constant that we were expecting. We assume that there is an average magnetization that uh, obeys the diffusion equation. And uh, we, so we, we thought that the main mechanism for this uh, noise generation could be due to diffusion. And um, notice that uh, this uh, sort of uh, system is a non-dissipative uh, dynamics. And also what we uh, were neglecting in this picture was the fact that uh, there could be uh, pairs of spins that were uh, close to each other, so they could be uh, very strongly coupled to each other. And um, assuming just uh, a diffusion, we started to work out what could be the noise uh, produced by this uh, diffusion mechanism when you uh, assume that these uh, spins are on the surface of the squids. And the crucial ingredient was that uh, when, you, uh, when they dr drive the electricity through the, uh, the electrical current through the squid, basically the magnetic field has a shape. Well, it's not very clear, but you see uh, it, uh, it tends to diverge at the edge. And uh, if you keep into account this uh, uh, surface current uh, density for, uh, for this current, basically what you end up is that uh, by using diffusion and this geometrical effect, you uh, find that uh, uh, the, spectrum, the spectrum noise uh, could be uh, 1 over f. But uh, there is a crucial point that uh, it is 1 over f depending on some uh, frequency. Namely, there is um, a, an energy scale that is uh, this ratio between the, the diffusion constant and the, the width, uh, the, the square of the width of the squid. And what uh, you find out in this theory, basically, is that uh, for frequency that are much smaller of this uh, particular value of this frequency, the spectrum should uh, flat out, so should be white, uh, saturated. While if you go to frequency that are larger of this uh, uh, particular value of the frequency, the, the spectrum is 1 over f. And this is, um, notice that uh, this, uh, um, this frequency depends on the dimension of the, on the width of the squids. So this uh, 1 over f noise that we find, for example, we can find it uh, for, for uh, this, uh, this value of this constant is of this 10 minus 2, 10 minus 1, only for very big squid, like uh, the one that was is measuring. But clearly, this value is quite high in the, in the frequency range if you go to the squid loops that Martinez was using at the time. So uh, what we were seeing by using just diffusion is that uh, in the, we couldn't understand uh, the, the low frequency noise in very small squid. 
And another important feature that we find out is that there is this um, geometrical ratio that is, depends on the radius of the squid and the width of the squid. And this is basically due to the fact that you are assuming that the spins uh, are only on the surface. And uh, uh, when we, we, we did this theoretical work, immediately after, there were <laughs> new work by a group of uh, Robin McDermott at Madison, Wisconsin. And um, what he, he studied, uh, he studied magnetism in squid at millikelvin. And what um, was the major finding of these works was that he was able to, to measure what is the typical spin density that you have in the squid. And this is value that was confirmed by many other groups then. So it's um, 5 times 10 to 17 uh, meter uh, minus 2. And uh, the other important thing that uh, were coming out from this study was that the interaction between the, the spin was rather strong. And for example, here you see that we study uh, susceptibility or independence on temperature in the squid. And in some uh, device, you see as a sort of cast that is reminiscent of the freezing in spin glass. And you see that the value is around 50 millik. And this was in agreement uh, with um, our first estimate with, uh, in our RKKY model. And um, in the same year, basically other group from D-Wave and uh, JPL in Pasadena did the geometrical study more carefully, and they found that uh, correctly this scaling. So I think that everyone now agrees that the spins are really on the surface, and uh, also what they clearly show is that uh, uh, the, the noise doesn't flatten out. So it, it keeps growing and keeps being 1 over f, basically. So it means that... Um, one is uh, to, to see something else. Diffusion is not uh, sufficient to have the low frequency uh, 1 over f uh, noise. So <coughs> what we, we started to think at the time was that, uh, OK, in our diffusion model, what uh, the, the main things that we are neglecting is the fact that we are thinking that uh, we are neglecting the fact, the possibility that uh, spins can be very closed. What does it mean that? That uh, two spins that are very close can be locked in some uh, singlet or triplet. And in order to, to flip, what they have to find is uh, to have a high energy in the system so that they can flip. And since these are sort of rare event, uh, if we somehow manage to show that this um, uh, spin ensemble can, ge can generate this high frequency energy by itself, then uh, we can find a way in which uh, this spin can be excited and creates uh, and be in sort of fluctuators and create noise. So the question that uh, we solved was the following. And it's more uh, a generic uh, work. It means that we start from an ensemble of spins. And these spins are uh, even uh, Heisenberg and Miltonia. And uh, the typical uh, scale of the interaction of the spin is much smaller than T. So we are considering that our system is uh, at high temperature. And uh, so it doesn't exchange with external bulk, like phonon or electrons. So this is the case that we are considering here. And uh, what we want uh, to, to calculate, to see, is that uh, nevertheless, because uh, of its inherent nonlinearity and because of the fact that there can be simultaneous excitation of many spins in this system, one can find uh, some uh, uh, frequency uh, at high, uh, uh, some, sorry, some uh, correlators at high frequency, much larger than the typical uh, interaction scale. So, the theory that we did was just to consider an isotropic spin, Heisenberg and Miltonian. And what you need to calculate, you are in the high temperature limit, so this is the kind of averaging. And what you need to calculate is basically the correlator that can be written in, uh, as a Taylor uh, series. And we want to, to calculate the asymptotic behavior of these moments at n equal to infinity and find basically how to, which is the value of these singularities. And this is a problem that we managed to solve exactly. And, and of course, the, the main difficulty that we had at the time was basically the fact that you do some assumption, like for example, that you are considering the, the fields that uh, the spin, the single spin uh, feels because of the interaction with the other, and we assume that the spin is Gaussian. But uh, nevertheless, the, the problem remains a bit difficult because uh, this uh, exchange field is a matrix. And so you, when, you, when you try to calculate the, the coefficient, you end up with a 
problems that is highly non-commutative. Nevertheless, uh, we, we managed analytically to solve this. And what we found that was useful for our problem is that the, um, the correlator of the spin correlator, the Fourier transform, goes, has a, a high exponential tail at our frequency. So the, this work, we managed to find the bounds, we calculate basically this value. And so uh, this means that this uh, ensemble of spins can uh, generate high energy to excite these uh, um, closed pairs. We gave an estimate of what could be the number of the rare spins that what could expect, and immediately, basically, what finds out is that this mechanism gives you, um, well, one over f noise with some logarithmic correction. So at this point, we were quite... Um, uh, uh, we were quite happy about this because uh, we, we found a way in which uh, we could explain noise at high frequency due to a combination and low, a noise at very low frequency due to a combination between diffusion and these uh, rare events. But then in 2009, there was an experiment by the group uh, of McDermott that uh, changed completely our uh, understanding. <coughs> and basically, what uh, McDermott did uh, is the following. He uh, studied uh, not only uh, flux noise, but also inductance noise. So he studied both uh, magnetization and susceptibility in the noise in the squid. And uh, he achieved this because he has a configuration in which he can inject some current. So this current basically generates a magnetic field uh, along the plane, the x direction. And the, 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 um, the magnitude of the fields that he has is around 100 microtesla. And he studied these two spectra. He found out that they are more or less, both of them one over f. But what was, was very puzzling for, for us is that uh, he found that when you go uh, at, very, at low temperature, you see that these two noise are highly correlated. And when I say highly correlated, it means that the value is very close to one. And that um, uh, clearly means that, uh, first of all, the, both these noise, both in the magnetization and susceptibility, must be generated, induced by the same phenomena. And also, another thing that he found that was uh, quite relevant for us, when he follows uh, the, 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 the path of this, uh, this noise, he could really see some very big jumps. These are jumps in the um, channel of the susceptivity, susceptibility. And you see they are equivalent to changing the flux about 500 micro phi zero. And this is equivalent to the fact that he, he sees uh, that there are a fluctuation due to uh, formation of, uh, of long uh, uh, range magnetic ensemble, and, this, uh, and the number of these uh, uh, spins in this ensemble as t of the order, if you do calculation, t 10 to the 3, 10 to the 4. So this uh, um, experiment, uh, uh, it was uh, really very difficult to, um, uh, to, to try to think what uh, could be a microscopic mechanism that was able to explain this? Because uh, if you think that these uh, spins are paramagnetic, and so you think that uh, maybe they can form a spin glass, immediately you see that this correlation is uh, zero. And, uh, and also, it's very difficult, we found out, to achieve uh, such a high degrees uh, of correlation, even if you think that some cluster with some special fractal structure can be formed. And uh, more uh, recently, in the, I think the last year, uh, we asked uh, McDermott to repeat uh, again this measurement just to see if it was not just an isolated uh, event. But it turns out that uh, even in uh, both in aluminum and niobium squids, these uh, cross correlations are present and they are uh, as uh, universal as uh, the, the flux noises. So the the possibility, the, the only possibility that we thought uh, could uh, be able to explain this uh, is the fact that somehow what you must have, you must have, uh, so you have the formation of this uh, ferromagnetic cluster, and you must have some pieces of this uh, ferromagnetic uh, cluster that flips and they change the position from fer a ferromagnetic state to a paramagnetic state. 
So in this case, if you uh, have uh, some mechanisms in, in which a ferromagnetic, in which you switch between a ferromagnetic and a paramagnetic uh, state, then uh, you have uh, um, variation of uh, fluctuation of magnetization and susceptibility that are uh, perfectly correlated. And, uh, but the problem was, uh, what could be this? So the, um, the, the thing that uh, we, we think is the following, that basically uh, a feature of having this uh, RKKY interaction is that uh, you have uh, a broad uh, range of uh, interaction. And what you, we know is that if you have uh, RKKY mechanism, depending on the concentration, what you can find is uh, either to have, uh, you have a transition between a spin glass or a ferromagnetic. So these were simulation that we did recently. So basically, we were uh, considering um, this Hamiltonian with uh, RKKY interaction, and we saw clearly that uh, for some value of concentration, uh, the, the state of the systems that start with some magnetization either maintain the magnetization, so for example, it's ferromagnetic, or lose it and so become a glass. And so basically, if you allow that there are some uh, uh, high density concentration of these uh, spins, then you can have, with this RKKY, uh, formation of this uh, uh, ferromagnetic. And now, the point uh, is the, the following, that uh, similarly to the argument that we reason when we were, um, uh, we were um, discussing the noise uh, in, the, in the spin uh, with this rare pair, even in this picture, what you can find is some, uh, configuration, some spins configuration in which the spins are very close. But in this case, the only way, the, in these states, uh, live very longly. And basically, what happens is that they can uh, uh, decay only by emission, instead of many flip now, of a large number of spin waves. So, and another thing that we expect, that is uh, reasonable to expect here, is that um, if uh, uh, the interaction uh, between the spins are strong, so it means that they are sitting very close, uh, to the boundary, and so one expect to, to have some anisotropy. So what uh, we did here is uh, the following. We just uh, took an, an uh, a spins that uh, we, we, we choose a random configuration of spin in uh, 2D, and um, these spins are classical. We simulate a classical block equation, and we introduce uh, um, anisotropy. And then uh, we let uh, the system evolve. So what is represented here, and then I will start this uh, little animation, is uh, basically the following. Uh, so we, uh, w the spins are initially um, uh, aligned, uh, is a ferromagnetic state along the, the, the direction, the, and, the, and the field is a, in the, along the plane, so it has a, the x direction. And what is plot here is the magnetization along the z direction. So the, when you see white, it means that there are uh, spins that are in the, in the, in the x direction. And uh, this uh, spot that you see basically is um, uh, showing the magnetization of the spin along the z direction. And uh, when uh, I consider a big area of this spot, it means that I have a space in this ensemble where I have uh, a collection of few spins that are uh, aligned with the with the Z field. And uh, let me see what you see. So I just want that uh, you, you see this is a, a devolution of time. And what I want that you focus at is something that will happen here. Basically, what you see here is that at a certain point, you might have in this uh, ensemble of dynamical spins the formation of some uh, uh, states that has a magnetization along the Z, and that lives quite longly. So, and this uh, clearly, this uh, sort of um, this uh, state uh, doesn't aff will uh, affect uh, create noise in the magnetization and it creates noise in the susceptibility. So 
uh, we think that uh, uh, a possibility uh, to explain why there can be this, uh, uh, the, the existence of this uh, very strong crocosylation is, uh, is due to the fact that in these, uh, in these systems, basically you might have the possibility to have these long leaf stays that are very similar to the breathers and the, the kind of physics that we are, discussing, that we are discussing here is uh, somehow similar to the physics that is discussed in, uh, in a recent paper by Boris and others when they consider a uh, Josephson chain. So I also want to show you something else. So we did um, uh, also a simulation to see what is the, the spectrum that we um, expect. And what you, you see is that uh, actually in this case, um, we consider just a block equation without uh, anisotropy. But what you, what you see is that uh, this was a simulation of large uh, classical systems with this uh, 2000 spin. And you see that uh, the noise that is generated is um, 1 over f. And this 1 over f with this, um, with this uh, um, coefficient, and by the way, it's a, it, all the experiment in which they measure this uh, 1 over f is never really 1 over f, but it's always uh, 1 over f at, uh, with coefficient get, that varies from 0 0.8 to uh, 0 0.9. We don't have yet uh, uh, done uh, the, the same analysis for the suscetibility, namely we, I don't have a, a, a spectrum to show. Uh, to show you, but uh, we expect that uh, similar spectrum will happen also for the suscetibility. And it's clear that because of, of these um, uh, long lived states, because the lo this low frequency noise is generated by these long lived states, we also expect to have uh, uh, basically 100% correlation between uh, the um, uh, suscetibility and the magnetization. So I want to to somehow conclude this, uh, this talk uh, by saying an important thing, that uh, it is very recent and uh, became a, a very, we became aware of this fact a few, ma few weeks ago when we were uh, at a meeting in the States. <laughs> Basically, uh, it was, there was a general feeling after uh, this, uh, people started to, to work with this noise in the uh, superconducting qubits, that okay, this is a noise is difficult to get rid of, but it's a very low frequency noise. So if we think of implementation in quantum computation, we can always use uh, echo and uh, we can get rid of it. And now there are very recent experiments that uh, are uh, a measurement done by the group of uh, Will Oliver at uh, MIT Lincoln Lab that uh, unfortunately shows that um, uh, something really very surprising, but that uh, indeed this one over F noise can be a serious problem also for relaxation. And what uh, they do is that they, they managed to, they, they built uh, uh, several qubits, like here they are measured 21 qubits, and uh, these are uh, uh, qubits that are flux qubits and are generated with a very high quality aluminum junction. And uh, they are focused on studying the relaxation of these qubits. And um, what uh, the first things that they were achieving is that uh, they, they now have a qubit fabrication that is highly, highly reproducible. And um, so they, they can generate uh, very different qubits at different frequency. And what uh, uh, they find out is that um, the, the measure T1 is uh, falls very nicely of all the qubits and agree with some predicted T1, where you consider in this, uh, when you put in this T1, basically the noise spectrum, not of an omnic noise that they would expect uh, at this high frequency. These uh, qubits are at uh, 5 and 10 gigahertz. But uh, it fits very well. All they fall into a calculation of noise with uh, uh, 1 over f spectrum with the amplitude of the low frequency noise. And this is uh, something that was uh, hinted in uh, some experiment that they did in 2011, where they could see that um, there were measurements in relaxation that, uh, uh, that when you extrapolate the level of 1 over f noise were matching this value. But here is more consistent. And so they, they claim really that uh, this 1 over f flux noise uh, seems to cause uh, qubit relaxation. 
And uh, this is, uh, I think, uh, something remarkable because I think that this is uh, one of the, the few examples, I don't know, I, I don't know any other example in physics in which you can have a scaling in one of behavior that uh, cover uh, so many orders of magnitude, like uh, 13 order of magnitude. So um, I think that uh, uh, still there are things that uh, uh, worry us, but uh, uh, somehow we, we have the feeling that with this uh, uh, understand, with this fact that we are seeing that there are these long-lived states in these, uh, uh, in these pins, maybe this is the, the right way to, yes, to, um, to explain this, uh, to understand this mechanism. And as you see, it seems that it's, uh, it's quite important to be able really to understand that because uh, echo will not help. And when we start to, to couple and uh, to think maybe to do some error correction, then in order to couple, you need the squid loops. And then you see that uh, this noise uh, be will become important even at this uh, very high frequency. So I, with that, I think I said more or less what I wanted to say. So I just want to say that I'm very, I want to thank the organizing to be the possibility to be here and to congratulate Boris with his birthday. And uh, that's it. So I think. Uh,